too many juggling too many things today. Hello. Okay. Um, we'll get started. So um, many of us, our roles are about providing support to researchers to make their research outputs open access. And hopefully um, you'll find that your stakeholder group is represented in the collaboration we're going to talk about today. So we've had publishers, funders, research organisations and more um, that have worked together to deliver this free and its stakeholder agnostic open access books toolkit. Um, the aim of the toolkit is to help authors better understand open access to books and to provide them with some real practical support in getting published. Now, why, why this toolkit? Well, from a research organisation perspective, I got involved because of a number of reasons. Open access is included as good research practice in our guidance and policies. And authors often ask us about making books open access. But often we've got very little to offer them in terms of advice or funding. Also, there are some funders that mandate open access to books in the UK, notably the Wellcome Trust, and also the UK Research and Innovation and the Future Research Excellence Framework exercise in the UK are considering open access to books. Um, and we struggle, uh, to be frank, to find ways to support the arts researchers. Uh, and of course, books tend to be more prevalent in the arts. So um, this led in um, the 2019 Art to Art um, session. Um, we ran a workshop uh, along with some friends from Springer Nature, and we chose to look at the, the challenges associated with open access to books. Um, and the discussion showed there really was a clear demand for further support and education on the options available to authors. So uh, we approached OA Pen um, as a possible stakeholder agnostic home for a toolkit. And we were really delighted when they agreed to work together with us on this. Now, there's an editorial advisory board, again, with those different stakeholders, represented publishers, research organisations, funders, suppliers. Um, and it makes me really very happy to say the experience has been very positive. The guidance was drafted collaboratively and feedback in each article was taken on with the aim of ensuring impartiality. So I'll now hand over to Tom and he'll give you a short delve into the toolkit and tell you how you can get involved. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so having shared some of the motivations for uh, creating a toolkit and what it aims to achieve, We'd now like to briefly walk you through the toolkit site for a first impression and to show some of its contents and features. So the Open Access Books Toolkit is publicly available online on its own website, oabooks-toolkit.org. And when visiting the website, you'll start your journey on the homepage, uh, as you can see here, uh, where you can see a, a menu bar at the top, an introduction uh, on the toolkit and its aims for offers and a number of buttons that one can pick from to start navigating the, the toolkit. The four buttons at the top right of the screen, lifecycle, FAQ, keywords, and glossary, can all be used to find your way around the toolkit, depending on what you are looking for. Um, so as shown and mentioned in the previous slide, a user can make use of several navigation options to go through the toolkit. The first being a typical research lifecycle uh, for books, as you can see here on the right-hand side. Uh, the research lifecycle in this case is broken down into eight stages, planning and funding, conducting research, consider publishing options, write and submit manuscript, peer review, book contract and license, book is published and disseminated, uh, and finally research is reused. Now, the research lifecycle allows researchers to quickly find information within the toolkit which could be relevant to them, uh, depending on where they currently are in the research life cycle. The second navigation option uh, makes use of the frequently asked questions or FAQs. The FAQs provide readers with a short and concise answer to the question. And in addition to this, links out to other toolkit articles or trusted sources on the web that provide further information on the, top on the topic for users who want to find out more. The third option uh, you can see listed here is the glossary. Open access and open access book publishing specifically makes use of various terms that might be new for researchers and sometimes cause confusion. Through the glossary, a user can find out more about a term uh, he or she came across, overheard, 
or would be interested in for any other reason and visit the glossary page first. An example could be impact and how this relates to open access book publishing. The glossary term also lists toolkit articles that touch upon impact within their text for more, more context and can include links to other trusted sources on the web. Again, uh, allowing the user to go further and learn more about this uh, particular aspect. Uh, lastly, users can make use of a keyword index to search for articles and information on certain key terms, such as licensing, funding, or marketing. Selecting a keyword will then result in an overview of all the articles within the toolkit that make mention of the given keyword. Um, now, the various uh, navigation options help users to quickly find what they are looking for in the toolkit. The toolkit includes over 30 short articles, which have been uh, deliberately kept short and concise in length, as you can see here, uh, allowing users to quickly move from article to article or to just find uh, what they are looking for within a minute or two. Topics uh, discussed throughout the toolkit include uh, what is open access, a myth-busting article on common myths about open access, and an article on contracting and copyright, for instance. As you can see here, each article follows a clear structure, allowing users to easily read or skim through the article, providing various links connecting users to additional resources. As mentioned, all toolkit articles are of a short and concise nature, bearing in mind uh, ease of use for the user. The toolkit also serves as a signposting tool, however. Uh, for users that want to learn more about a specific topic, such as how open access books are disseminated and made discoverable, as you can see here, each article uh, will provide a vetted list of source acknowledgements, references, and further readings, each of these linking out to existing information uh, elsewhere on the web and resources available. While the toolkit is written to support authors interested in publishing their books open access, the toolkit also touches upon the different stakeholders and their role in the OA book landscape and uh, how they support authors in publishing open access books. For instance, the toolkit includes articles on funders and open access books, eligibility criteria for grant applications, as well as an overview of funders that uh, actually provide funding for publishing open access books. The toolkit also provides guidance on the role of research institutions uh, and the role they play in enabling OA book publishing uh, and supporting offers. This support can be in the areas of grant application, covering publication costs, funding, or training and guidance on open access generally, for instance. As can be expected, a number of articles are included on the role of open access book publishers. Um, as you can see here, how authors can find a suitable open access book publisher for their manuscript and what type of services publishers uh, offer and how publishers may be able to help further disseminate and market uh, a researcher's book once it's available open access. Um, moving on, uh, there's also the opportunity to, to get involved with the tool toolkit. Uh, it will be, first of all, be updated regularly and maintained by the Global uh, Editorial Advisory Board. And future developments can be expected uh, both in terms of uh, content and technical features based on user feedback. And uh, you could all visit the Open Access Books Toolkit site uh, and get in touch with any questions, comments, or further ideas for further uh, development. So thank you very much for taking an interest in the Open Access Books Toolkit. And thank you, Valerie, for um, co-presenting. Co and um, yeah, we'd be very curious to hear your thoughts and feedback. And as mentioned, you can always get in touch or leave feedback at a, a later time using the link on this slide or in the chat. Okay, so um, we'll keep an eye on the, the chat window uh, while we're, while we're um, just finishing out this particular session. What I would like to know is um, of, the, of the materials that you've already provided, are there any that are particularly popular, you know, you, you notice people are going to the most? Um, so we did take a look at, at some of the initial uh, usage and where, and where users would go to. We noticed there was quite a lot of interest in the articles on uh, what is what is open access, and also about the myth busting. So looking at common misconceptions about open access. So there was a lot of interest in, in those articles. 
Next to that, quite some interest in uh, licensing and also in the funding overview of where to find funding for open access books. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, okay, time for one more question, um, which is from, from Michael Upshall. How old researchers find out about this initiative? Um, well, we have a, a fairly large editorial advisory board um, coming from all parts of the open access books uh, landscape, including funders, publishers, researchers, uh, libraries, research support, and other organizations. And together with them, we try to bring the word out and um, also engage in promotional opportunities. Um, but we've just uh, launched a toolkit in September uh, last year. Um, and there's also a lot of volunteer effort involved, but we welcome any opportunity. To May I add to okay. that, Fiona? Oh, that makes okay. sense. All right, okay, yes. I was just going quickly. to say that um, obviously we advertise it in our local institution and we are members of lots of professional networks and we encourage them to um, advertise it within their research organisation. But again, if anyone has any suggestions on how we should do this, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for, for try, priming that up for um, you know, other conversations in other, other venues. So, um, Tom, could you start unshare so that Michael can share, and we'll um, we'll go on to the next the next talk. Thanks for that. So Michael Upshaw on um, AI and uh, manuscript submissions. Yes, thanks very much for the, um, for, for the opportunity to participate. This is, um, this is not so much a sort of a, a set of slides as a, as a, as a suggestion, some, some ideas for sort of uh, to, to, to get people talking. So I very much welcome feedback from, uh, from, from the session, very much in the spirit of uh, the whole Researcher to Reader conference. Um, so um, my name is Michael Upshaw. Um, and I uh, work with, with Unsilo. Although this is not a presentation about Unsilo, the, the, the reason for showing this slide is simply because uh, we've been providing AI tools um, for some time um, to, um, to, to publishers, um, and, um, and uh, these slides are based on feedback we've got from, from publishers and from people using AI tools and comparing them with human, uh, human checks. So um, when, you, um, when you have a manuscript submitted for, um, uh, for evaluation, um, um, it's worth thinking a little bit about what the um, what it is you're trying to achieve. Of course, one thing we all agree on is that um, uh, we want to reduce the time to publication. We want to get um, I mean, publishers, authors, uh, institutes all agree on that. But um, reducing the time to publication is only one of the criteria because at the same time you're hoping to improve the quality and um, and uh, and avoid disasters. And sometimes it's the avoiding disasters which is paramount. And sometimes improving the quality improving the quality can sometimes be a rather nebulous concept but avoiding disasters is um, is very much close to home so um, so everyone every publisher wants to find the article that claims to have found a cure for cancer um, and uh, have a good look at it before they publish it um, you want to check also such things as if there are links to retracted articles or if they're missing data uh, manipulated images is another uh, another uh, worrisome uh, worrying point um, so salami slicing and self-citing are uh, other examples of things where you you want to have a very close look before you uh, before uh, you you proceed to publication. So so as I mentioned, time and quality uh, to some extent um, um, in inverse proportion. The um, uh, the more the, um, uh, the you would expect, the more time you spend on a manuscript, the more the better the quality. Um, but um, um, one of the challenges is that um, when um, um, when we look at um, and this is interesting for AI generally, when we compare AI with human processes, um, it's not always a straightforward comparison um, to um, to understand first of all exactly what checks you're running uh, at the moment and um, whether you do indeed carry out all those checks and. Um, um, and then when you apply, when you change the system and you put in more um, uh, AI based tools, whether you're doing a kind of a like for like comparison. Um, so uh, to give you a, a, um, an example of this, one of the paradoxes when we started um, providing AI tools was that publishers reported the whole operation took longer than before. And it turned out that um, um, the AI was running many more, many more checks than, the, than they were formally running by hand. It's just that the, um, the, the publishers were always aware of what checks their editors were running. So it's very important to compare like with like when you're comparing machines with humans. 
But that's not, um, um, it's not just as simple as that, just look, looking at a list of 10 checks and saying, well, the, the, the machine does them and the human, and human does them. Um, the truth is that um, humans are better at doing some checks, uh, more, some checks than others. And um, uh, this sounds like a tautology, which checks do humans do, the checks that are easier for humans to carry out. But um, there's a, there's a, uh, one of the things we, we, I think we've, we've, we've understood from this process um, that's fundamental to the use of, uh, of, of, of AI or AI related tools, and this applies to, to any tools, um, um, is that um, uh, humans are good at some things and machines are good at others. Um, so um, let's just have a little think about what um, um, what machines do well and what humans do well. Um, it's well known that um, that um, although humans can um, uh, uh, a human can memorize the entire um, uh, text of Hamlet, um, but um, uh, trying to memorize more than about five or six phone numbers is um, uh, is, is impossible. Um, and um, uh, that gives some indication of what uh, machines and what humans can do. So machines are great at counting. Machines can create the number of count, number of words, number of figures, and uh, for a human to count the number of words in a manuscript would be um, would be challenging. Um, machines are good at finding things. That is finding in even an academic article, which is only a few thousand words long. It takes several minutes to scroll through an article to find a specific reference to say a figure or a table. And um, and the other thing machines are good at doing is linking. Um, Jumping to um, to uh, to uh, related articles or uh, something like that, you can do it in two or three clicks, but a machine can do it faster than that. By contrast, humans are not very good at any of those um, simple arithmetical things, but humans are great at making judgments based on the information they have in front of them, if they have the information in front of them. Um, so, um, so it would seem that um, a good um, apportioning of skills would be to, um, uh, as you can see from this slide, get the machine to do the counting and the finding and the, um, the identifying and get the human to do the, to do the judgments. And that would appear to be a good balance, uh, a good, if you like, um, heuristic for, 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 um, for implementing AI-based um, based checks. Um, you might say that, um, that, um, uh, that, that a measure of success would be um, reducing the number of retracted articles, but the number of retracted articles is tiny. The, um, um, uh, 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 the latest estimate I could find is around 0.04%. Um, That's a, a very, very small proportion of articles are retracted, so it's unlikely there's going to be much change in that. Um, um, and uh, if anything, retractions, um, a science article in 2008 says retractions have increased because, um, because um, uh, publishers are using more uh, tighter editorial policies. And those editorial practices are likely to get tighter still with the use of, the use of AI. Um, but, um, but retractions are a rather blunt measure. There are, um, uh, there are many other factors in, a, in, a, in an academic article which can, um, can um, assist the, the, um, the, the making that article better. And um, uh, self-citation is an example. There is no absolute figure for what constitutes an unacceptable number of self-citations, but it may well be that a human might look at an article which um, has uh, maybe 15 or 20 self-citations and, uh, and would then, uh, the human editor would make a decision about whether that's acceptable or not. That seems to be an example of the combination of machine and human. Finally, I would, um, I would just add a, a really simple statistical point, which is that um, um, when machines look at things, they, they're working, uh, typically the, the AI tools that, um, uh, that, that, that we use, most uh, AI tools used in, in this area are statistically based. They're, um, they're, they're, they're looking at proportion of errors. Uh, they're, 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 and so, um, and because of that, um, it's important to remember that um, if, um, if a machine hits a problem, um, that, that if a machine fails for in, in one test or another, um, it's important to, um, to recognize whether that, um, um, how, um, how significant that error is. And the only way to do that is to count the number of times it didn't make a, make a mistake. So this is where um, the proportion of failures to, to, to passes is, um, is very important when evaluating AI tools. So one error in 10 is, uh, is a disaster, but one error in 100 may well be, may well be acceptable. So um, just to conclude, um, hopefully um, uh, 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 given some pointers about how humans and machines can be, can be blended to give the best results. And, um, um, and specifically that's um, typically getting the machine to do the counts and leaving humans to make, um, make decisions. But as I said at the outset, all this is very much for discussion and, um, and I'd welcome feedback on, uh, on the publisher's own experience of uh, implementing AI tools and getting them um, and uh, their, their, their response to it. So thanks very much. 
Thank you ever so much, Michael. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on chat. I think, again, it takes people a moment perhaps to get their, their fingers in gear. Um, but in the, mean, in the meantime, um, oh, actually, someone just turned up. So my chat window just moved. So from Valerie, in fact, do you have recommendations on what AI authors should use for automatic checks? Oh, there's a there's a there's a there's a, a, a proliferation of tools available <laughs> available today. There's any number. Um, my recommendation is um, is hopefully from this talk and uh, of how to sort of um, go in um, in a knowing way to sort of don't to, don't take these um, don't don't take these tools for granted. Have a look at them and to think um, think um, what is it they're doing? Are they making decisions for me or are they helping me make decisions? I think that's the, the that's the question I'd ask. So I don't uh, I'd love to I'd love to give a shopping list, but I don't think there is one. I think the uh, I think you should make the decisions based on uh, um, uh, hopefully a better awareness of um, what the, what these tools are capable of doing and not. Okay um, and actually I've, I've got one question as well which is it's about the interface I guess between machines and humans. Mm. Uh, I mean is there is there concern amongst um, you know humans who are already in these sorts of roles that they're being replaced um, and you know what, what what can you do about that about integrating Absolutely. the machines into the workflow? Absolutely, the, um, um, it's a, it's it's um, uh, it's very common that um, uh, that often the people who are um, uh, who who carry out the evaluation are the very ones who are the most um, are most afraid of being being replaced, and so um, so it's not surprising that um, uh, that they are uneasy about the, uh, the the checks that are being carried out. But what I've what I've hoped to show is that. Um, um, that the, the, these checks don't replace editors because the human one thing machines are not good at is making the making judgments and so um, so what um, what I hope um, I've shown is that um, it's possible to use these tools to improve decision making improve the whole manuscript evaluation process so the humans become more effective and that's um, uh, and that's something I think we can all agree on. Oh, thank you, Michael. That makes sense. Um, and um, again, as we we, we um, keep saying, you you can reach out to Michael through any of the spatial chats or, or other um, connection connected um, opportunities, either through this conference or, or outside. I mean, we very much want to keep these conversations going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Veronica, you want to sort of tee up? So this is um, Veronica Duhovnikova on cargo services. Take it away. Hi. Thank you very much, Fiona. And I would like to take maybe give everybody a chance to take a, a breath and slow down a little bit of base of our presentation. <laughs> actually, Veronica, are you, um, I think you're not in um, presentation mode yet. You're not actually on slideshow yet. Or it's not... I think I should there we be are. already. Yeah. All right. Uh, so hi, everybody. Pleasure to meet you. My name is Veronica. I am the key account manager in Cargo Publishers and the purpose of this presentation is that I quickly walk you through the latest cargo strategy and how we as a publisher would like to provide, to extend our portfolio services in order to reach um, every step of the research cycle and support researchers all along the way. So I'll briefly start with a quick presentation on cargo for those who may have not heard our name. Uh, so we are a biomedical publisher with a history of 130 years old already and uh, located in Basel, Switzerland, which uh, has a publisher which has traditionally been very much focused on subscriptions, but has gradually recently started transferring to becoming an open access publisher. And as I mentioned earlier, extending its portfolio of services and products so that it goes beyond the traditional publish and access model, but also further across the research cycle of health sciences. That's about Cargo in a nutshell. How do, do we, would we like to achieve this? Basically, Cargo has come up with this strategy of which can be abbreviated as PACS or Published Access Curation and Services, each of which stage is meant to cover a need across the re cycle of knowledge. P stands for Publish. How do we do this? Oh dear, I think Veronica might have frozen. Um, go for a minute. She may have to leave and then come back again. Right. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to, because Veronica will have another opportunity to present this tomorrow. Um, so I must suggest that we um, move on to, to Jennifer Smith, if, um, if Jennifer is um, ready to present. So I will just end up there. Um, Jennifer, are you able to, to step up? I know this is a couple of minutes earlier than you were expecting. Thank you. And um, you may still be on mute. Hi. And yeah, you're Hi. there. All right, I will I will go into mute. You're currently on the um, the presenters view, I think. So you need to go into presentation okay. mode and I'll leave okay. you to it. Uh, just one moment. I know it was a little sudden. Uh, apologies, I'm getting a message to sign in. Uh, just one moment. Just one moment. Okay, um, I'm not sure if this is an issue, but let's give it a go. Uh, okay. I'm just trying this one more time. Okay. If that's the only thing you can get to, Jennifer, I think that's fine. Okay. Have you got that now? Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Apologies. Yeah. So, hello. And yes. So, I'm talking to you uh, today, working from home, as we all are. Um, but I am from St. George's uh, University of London, which is the UK's only dedicated medicine and health sciences university. Okay. So, usually um, at this time of year, we're uh, gathering at Tavistock Square in the um, BMA headquarters. So this is the ceremonial staff and it's a nice reminder of uh, where we would be usually. And um, yeah, so I look forward to your reflections at the end of this short slide deck. So if any of you are not aware of um, what a preprint is, this is a quick recap for you. I'm not going to read out what's on the slide. You can hopefully take that in in one go. Um, so the emphasis there uh, from EPMC is it, it is a complete scientific manuscript uh, without the peer review. So preprints have turned the publishing process upside down or back to front if you like. So it's a change from a curate and publish um, mo model to um, publish then curate. So this is how the Faculty 1000 uh, platform works and this allows for posting of preprints and open peer review. Um, and you can see that several um, funders have actually really got behind it. And that's some of the funders that use the, this platform uh, for their research that they fund. Uh, so other examples of preprint platforms are BioArchive and MedArchive. So it's purely the posting of the preprint that goes on there, um, not the peer review. And um, some of the more established for-profit uh, publishers are now allowing preprint publication as well. Uh, so BioArchive and MedArchive are, are not for profit. Um, so given the events of the past year, I asked several of St George's researchers uh, for their thoughts and experiences um, of preprints. So this was the first question of three that I asked them. So I was wanting to know about their involvement over the past year. 
So here was some of the responses that I got, and it was quite a range going from still thinking about it um, to actually we've moved everything. We're publishing everything as preprint first over the past year, which is quite, quite a striking point uh, to me. That's quite interesting point there. Um, and I think it can be dependent as well on who's funding the research and the research field. Second question that I asked was um, if, if our researchers had concerns, what were they? Uh, why, why would they not publish preprints first? Um, so we had a range of responses around um, the scientific integrity of the papers. Um, peer review can be seen as strengthening uh, papers and society journals do that well. Um, there was uh, issues around the time it takes uh, to respond, particularly turnaround time for, for responding to comments. Um, but, but as well, you can see that uh, experience has totally swept away hesitancy for some researchers. Um, so there does seem to be a, an understanding that preprints are here to say, uh, stay for the foreseeable. So my third question uh, was that if you had um, a question, ideas, message for, uh, for the audience here at this conference, what would it be? So our researchers um, are looking for more um, sharing of, of uh, understanding how preprints uh, are being used, um, the examples of reputable research groups. So I was wondering if there's any funders on, on the, this uh, presentation on this call that uh, might be willing to promote the use of preprints, how, how that's helped science move along. Uh, they want some flexibility uh, uh, from, from publishers around the speed of turnaround time for comments, and they'd like to see that good flow of information linking uh, preprints to the peer review studies. So they really find a value in those three key points, the speed, the integration, and to enable global participation. Okay, so we have a uh, tradition really. So summing up, we've got the old models. Uh, they're very solid, but they won't always move very fast. Uh, we have new models um, with speed can come risk as well. And uh, we all rely on safety features. Um, so I think the outlook for preprints is hopeful because the drivers of change for preprints have been the funders and the researchers themselves. So I think as well, circling back to the uh, ceremonial staff of the BMA at the start there, um, there are probably parallels uh, around the trust issues. Um, you know, why was the, the medical uh, BMA founded and the General Medical Council, uh, questions about trust there and authority. Um, and we have similar questions today. Um, so <clears throat> tradition, I think it, it's good, traditional ways as long as they serve a purpose. Over the past year though, we've seen a real urgency to accelerate this, the research process. And I think that preprinting coupled with open peer review um, is sort of lowers the barriers for a lot of researchers to, to get the opportunity to present their research. Um, there was somebody in, in the panel discussion on inclusivity earlier um, about the costs of open access. So this lowers the barriers. So um, I think the question for all of us at, at the conference is, uh, are these three questions? Um, so preprinting can provide a more level playing field. Um, and, and, and what can we all do to, to make that trust um, and, and the, the whole works around the process around pre-printing better. So that's in a nutshell my presentation. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. So, um, so again, I'll have a, a look. Um, oh, I've got a, a question from, from Valerie. So moving with the times, she says, we host some preprints that do not have natural preprints homes, like the archive on our research organization repository. I have heard from some other sites that they are reluctant to do so. So what's your view? Um, well, this is a conversation that I hope I can have uh, this year at my institution, because really um, we had we have the policy that we would make either version of record or accepted manuscript available via our repository. Uh, now, obviously, that's kind of a ref 
a REF compliant kind of approach to things. Um, but obviously with more researchers pre-printing, we will need to review it. So I'm looking to have a conversation this year with uh, other colleagues in the institution around that. Okay, um, I think Valerie would like to have a bit further, a bit more peer review and stakeholder discussion. I'm not sure we can cover that in the next sort of minute and a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I guess it might be nice to flag up as well or interested in, as an ex publisher. Um, is there a, a long term business model, do you think, for preprints? I'm just thinking that, that mm -hmm. part of the trust isn't, isn't entirely about the content, it's also about the longevity, um, and, you know, persistence of the content. Is that something that worries people? Hmm. Um, um, I would say that I suppose the archive content, um, archive for, 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 I can't get my words out, for physicists <laughs> has been there for some time. Um, and, and I'm sure, um, you know, I'm sure if something is thought to be valuable, um, I would hope it wouldn't be lost in this day and age when we have a lot of them, um, you know, we've got the um, curation, digital preservation and curation organisations uh, always looking to make sure and institutions like the British Library looking to archive, um, archive and, and um, you know, ensure that the content isn't lost. Okay, I mean, hopefully, I guess, you know, we'll be watching this space and, and the solutions will evolve as the problems are, are addressed. Yes. So, um, well, thank you very much, Jennifer. Could you stop on sharing so that Diane sure. can step out? Yep. Thank you. Step up, sorry. Um, so, as always, um, please reach out to Jennifer if you have anything else that you, you'd like to talk about at greater length or perhaps one to one. Um, and in the meantime, we're going to have um, Diane Cogan talking about um, open access workflows. Yeah. <laughs> I get the right screen. <laughs> oh, yes, the, there, the, we go. there was a, a slight glitch with some of the programs. So some of you might have been expecting um, Zoe Wake Hyde. She's actually going to be in the final session this afternoon, but the scripts are still slightly behind. Okay, so, so can everyone see my screen? We can, and we can see you. So thank you very excellent, much. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Tick the boxes. Hi everyone, my name's Diane Cogan, I'm with Ringgold, and I'm going to talk about how organisational hierarchies can help with open access workflows, which is a fairly strong theme of the meeting. Okay, so accurate organisational information is very key for open access workflows, and for these I'm talking about transformative agreements and gold uh, OA, so APC payments. And of course, there's many models of transformative agreements, but most commonly, uh, we seem to be looking at read and publish, publish and read, and now the, the new community action publishing from uh, PLOS has pioneered that. These are complex to set up. Um, there's a, a big old negotiation you need to go through uh, about number of articles published and a uh, number of customer organizations to spend and where the papers are coming from, so author organisations. And you usually need to collect this sort of information over probably about three, three years. Once the deal's up and running, they've got to be managed um, over, uh, over time and looking at the, the, where articles are, are coming from, which organisations. And often these deals are made at, at multiple levels of an organisation. They're not necessarily just at the top level. They can be at department level um, and they can also be made with a consortium. So there's lots of different stakeholders involved. And certainly for Gold OA, you need to know for APC payment whether an organisation uh, author at an organisation has a discount or waiver. Uh, for the APC. So accurate organisation information is key for transformative agreements um, and for APC management. So I'm going to say a, a little bit about authors because authors affiliate at the level of the organisation that they do their research. It could be a department or a school, a laboratory or a, a government research institute. Um, so it's very important to know which author, which organisation the author is part of and whether it has a transformative agreement in place or, or is a member of a consortium with a transformative agreement in place. And similarly for Gold Open Access, we need to know whether that organisation is part of a, a waiver or discount scheme. But just knowing the author's organisation is not usually enough. 
We also need to know about the relationships within the author's organisation, who it's linked to, and also the relationship with other organisations. So, for example, is the organisation of the author part of a transformative agreement or an APC discount or waiver scheme? Or is the organisation's parent part of a transformative agreement or waiver scheme? And then which parent? Because often organisations can have multiple parents, so it's not straightforward. And then we have to think, well, perhaps if the uh, transformative agreements with a consortium, then, you know, is is that organisation a member of that consortium? So lots of lot different relationships uh, we need to keep in mind. So I'm with Ringgold and Ringgold's um, identified database organisations includes very detailed hierarchies that make the relationships between and among uh, organisations very clear. And we also map consortium memberships so you can roll an organisation up to, to uh, a relevant consortia. So I'm just going to show a few examples of, um, of how this works with author organisations. So the first slide, I'm looking at three authors here um, from different organisations. We've got Queen Square Brain Bank, we've got UCL Centre for Immunology and the Wilson Institute for Biomedical Research. And on this slide, you can see the, the hierarchies for these three organisations and they all link up to, they're all part of University College London and they're all part of the University of London system. So we would know that perhaps if those authors would be part of an agreement at, at any of those levels, really. So again, looking at um, these three authors that we just mentioned and perhaps another couple from, from different institutes, they will roll up to a, a, another organisation, Queen Mary University of London. So we can show that these authors might be part of a deal that's um, been done by the division or the department of the faculty, or it might be a deal done with a university or with the university system. So uh, it, we, can, we can find that out for all of those authors. And then which parent, because if I'm an author at the Princess Royal Hospital, um, I've got potentially three parents, the University of Sussex, the University of Brighton and, and the NHS Trust. So there may be an agreement in place with, with either one of these parents and that is relevant. You really need to know that if it's part of a transformative agreement or an APC waiver or discount scheme. Um, and then finally, uh, relationships with consortia. Um, because if we look at those five authors that I mentioned before from these different institutes, they will roll up to those organisations, so University College London or Queen Mary University of London, but they're all GISC members. So if, if you've negotiated an agreement with GISC, uh, then those authors would be relevant to that agreement. So that is really it's a bit of a quick whiz through, but. Uh, that's to show that really organisational hierarchies, hierarchies are very key. So you need to know about your author organisations and where they link, um, link to. So I I'm not going to talk a lot about the Identify database, but if you want to talk and uh, find out a little bit more, then I'm, we've got a virtual stand at the meeting. You can meet me in the network room and, or, you know, in the, or in the meeting hub. So please, please come along and speak to me. Has anyone got any questions about that? It's a bit of a rapid romp through hierarchies, but... Uh... Okay, well, there are some people saying that um, in chat that they're going to come and, and see you in um, ex you know, ex okay. experiment with the, the, the virtual um, ex exhibition as well. Um, I, I had a quick question actually, which was around um, updates. How, how, do, how do you make sure that, that the system is, is kept up to date? Well, we have a, a I mean, Ringo has, this is what we do. We curate the Identify database. So we have a whole team of permanent members of staff and we, we work with researchers, about 40 of them around the world and they're constantly updating the database. And certainly consortium relationships change very all the time. Uh, so we, we, you know, really have to be on top of that to keep them up to date. So we, you know, we're adding new, new records all of the time to the database. About, it's growing by about 5% a year. 
um, but there's a rate of change within the database of about 25%. So it's a constant um, feat. Gosh. We've got we've got over half a million records in the database, so it's it's a lot of work. But that's that's what we do. So. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> well, on that note, um, thank you very much, Dan. Um, okay. Well, so thank you very pleasure. much. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much to um, all our presenters and our our. Um, lovely delegates who, who've come and, and listened and contributed as well to the session. Um, could you, if you um, log out of Zoom and then go into the open air platform, the, the next session is just lining up and that's um, Ivan Oransky looking at research integrity. Um, and there's another lightning poster session this afternoon during the, 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 um, the networking um, afternoon tea break. So um, hopefully see many of you there again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.